the, the project of transforming society. Uh, symbolically, it started with us adopting a new constitution in 1996. But, but the real work meant that we needed to consciously create a new society. A society that does not recognize apartheid, a society that sees itself as non-racial, inclusive, productive, and quite uh, embracing across all those types of races. In other words, setting up um, municipalities are new, putting in place new structures, putting in place new systems, and of course, ensuring that there is a redemarcation of space, size, so that there's more functionality and sustainability of these municipalities. Now, part and parcel of what we needed to do as part and parcel of bringing together new spaces was to make sure that we take our people along. In fact, we are driven by people in whatever it is that we do, because after all, these spaces are for them. They are the ones that live in these spaces, they function in these spaces, they ick their livelihood out of very functional spaces. So it was quite important that we start to say what kind of a future are people looking for? They're looking for integration. They, they no longer see themselves as black and white, young and old. There's new technology that is changing the way in which things are done. So City Futures was looking at exactly that. What's the inspiration? What's inspiring them? So the idea of the South African City Futures project goes back quite a way. Um, I recall as far back probably as 2011, 2012, having conversations between ourselves and Sharon Lewis of the JDA, that's the Johannesburg Development Agency, and uh, Edgar Peterson, and, and probably other combinations of people, you know, in various um, configurations, uh, just talking about uh, various issues. I think concerns about um, the quality of public participation and how it had become too much of a checkbox compliance kind of thing and perhaps losing part of the spirit of what one ideally wants, particularly at a neighborhood level where you want now we call it active citizenry, but uh, just this idea that people can really take some charge of their areas and their lives and the kind of futures they want to have. Our conversation really started when we were thinking about township development and the, the outcomes of some of the township development projects, um, particularly uh, an area like Vilakazi Street in Soweto, where a lot of the, the home upgrades we're changing the way the neighbourhood looked. Most of the processes that relate to urban planning or community development, really the, the vantage point or the, the perspective of those processes are typically that of the state, of the government. In other words, it's the big picture, it's from the top down. It is really trying to capture a whole series of uh, quantifiable, nameable processes and, and trends. Whereas really people's lives of course are a lot more messy than that. It's a hodgepodge of different desires, different necessities, different failures, different mistakes, different ambitions and so forth. And the way in which all of us make sense of our lives and generally how we live our lives is through some form of, 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 of a narrative coherence. Um, so we uh, either see ourselves as the villains or we see ourselves as the heroes in our stories and we make sense of our everyday lives and that of those who are close to us and those who make our lives complicated uh, through, through various narrative accounts. All of our processes involve consultation around designs, around plans, um, but many of these participation processes are rolled out in a way that is just by rote. Um, so meetings are set up and, and uh, ideas are presented and discussed, but there's nothing um, that allows participants to really think about other ways of, of living and being in the city. So I think this idea of storytelling, the idea of people being able to clarify for themselves and think about the implicit narratives of their lives, it's really important to bring that to the fore. 
because it gets you closer to what really matters for people, but more importantly, it creates a common ground for people to have a shared conversation and also empathy for, for each other and with each other's lives. And in some ways, it could potentially help you to break down the straitjacket of formal, structured, official processes that are, of course, terribly alienating for most people. What you're trying to do is you're trying to facilitate a process where the people you are imparting a method onto or a process uh, onto are also ultimately not just the beneficiaries but are also the experts actually in a way in what they're doing and you're trying to order that in some way. It really was about imagination and how to get ordinary people to think um, in a different and creative way about the possibility of their future development of their neighbourhood. So we needed to find um, a kind of a template or a guide within which uh, workshops could be taken place within seven sites in South Africa and get consistent data from this. The reason for why this methodology becomes significant is, is it tries to address some of the uh, key shortcomings post-1994 of planning. Planning typically uh, negates some of the softer issues in our neighbourhoods, the stories of people, the complex historical terrain, and fails to acknowledge what those mean in the future of our neighbourhoods. One of the key ideas behind the methodology was to bring together um, three pillars. One included urban form, that's the existing settlement as you see it. The second is the stories of people. How could the stories of people, their imagination, their experience of a particular ter territory have relevance in planning? And the third one is to take the storytelling and urban form and triangulate it with um, scientific data, which is an urban simulation. Basically, we're looking for the middle space, so it was quite an intangible kind of place where the three of those things met, and those three lenses kind of combine, and we were trying to think up a method um, to get people who live and work and play in a neighbourhood itself to basically come together in a very short of space of time and to use those three lenses to think differently about their neighbourhood in the future and the future date we picked was 2030 for various reasons. Our current planning favours urban simulation, scientific data and a developmental agenda and that in doing so it compromises some of the sensitive softer matter that should define our neighbourhoods. The methodology basically um, ACC uh, built it up in an iterative way over time dreamt up this very quite an ambitious at first idea of how we're going to to, um, to work this out. There were two workshops that were proposed. One, the first one was about um, sensing place, trying to get a feeling as to what people feel, what's important in a particular place. And the second was about um, plotting and speculating based on those ideas. Those workshops ran on two consecutive weekends and that data was there thereafter synthesized. The first workshop looked at sensing place. It was important that the planning processes acknowledge the stories of people and the experiences of people of their particular neighborhoods in the planning process. So we, there was a few strategies that was devised to get people to register some of the assets and experiences of that neighborhood so that it could be part, be part of the planning process. One of them included um, journeys through your neighborhood. So you'd basically walk for a set period of time with a camera surveying the land, your neighborhood that you frequent, and tracking those things that are important, that you like or dislike, and saying that these are important things to consider in our planning process. You would then go and capture those elements through photography and say this is something that is desirable and I'd like to add to it, or it's things that I'd like to challenge and contest in my neighborhood. Through that scanning, that real-time experiential walk through that neighborhood, you are able to get a very quick feeling as to what is important or not. Why did you choose the mall? Yeah, because I especially like that it's a sort of open plan and public. It's, it feels very communal. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, he's gonna be in 
It's surprisingly profound, actually, because no, no one person in that group repeated the site. You know, everyone had their own unique place. And despite everybody in that group knowing the place very well, um, they, it, it, it was like the place revealed itself anew because everyone had their own particular um, place and it was quite revealing. You know, they saw, they literally saw the neighborhood through other people's eyes. During these walks, uh, we would like participants to imagine what it would be like to talk to the future in some way, say 2030, as the project proposes. If you had to talk to 2030, what would you take off this place as an artifact to talk about where we've come from? So we wanted to move across time in this little experiment. So you, through your walk, you would find an artifact that you think bears relevance. Good or bad or ugly, you, you think it's important to talk about where you come from. And that artifact is recorded with a particular story as to why you chose that and why you think it's important for that future that you aspire towards to acknowledge that object. So that artifact sort of inventory was pulled together. In order to get a collective sense about a particular neighborhood, we condensed or brought together the individual experiences of participants on those walks. We don't have a resource centre, we don't have a multi-purpose sports centre and I think this area would be ideal for that. The other thing that I don't like is like just next to Mercantile, there's a place there where children and people are staying, it's like a crime zone. So when they would walk and have a particular feeling about whether they like a place or dislike a place, we want to see whether that corresponds uh, as a feeling with other participants in that. We really need to somehow access the interior life of people on this walk. Going about, it's one thing showing people this is my favourite place and so on, but they don't really get a chance to um, share storylines and, and um, narrative about that. And um, also not everybody enjoys the floor and enjoys speaking to other people and has, a, has the voice for it. So when they come back to the workshop, they just have some alone time with this diagram. So let's say they've gone to the station and they feel emotional at the station. They feel this is an actual example from Kailiche. Someone said, I, I love the station because I, I see people there and it makes me feel proud that people are on the move, they're doing things, they're getting out there, they're going places. So she connected to her heart and uh, it opened up her heart. Someone else, um, when we were walking, we went through gang territory and it made her feel nervous and her, her, her palm started sweating so she connects it to her palm and she writes a little storyline about that. In plotting all of those individual responses onto a map you could get some consensus as to what that particular user group felt about that neighborhood and that was really insightful in giving a collective uh, feedback to larger planning processes as to what the neighborhood uh, should keep or respond to in planning. Think of one song that is very, very meaningful for you. Doesn't have to be popular, okay? But if you would have to play a song that in some way captures the spirit of this neighborhood, what would that song be? The second workshop was looking at plotting and speculating based on your senses of place that was done in the previous workshop. Um, to do this, we were, we were keen to get participants to imagine what their future was like in quite an um, uncompromised and uninhibited way, just to go wild and think that this is what I wish for my neighborhood. One of the biggest dreams is to develop to the space called the sun. To sunset. Uh, the place called that. So they want to develop this place where people intersect, get free Wi-Fi, 
and get to have a place where they can explore their talents. Uh, do you have market space for the youth, those who have their own businesses? Just to have a safer space for people to, inter to interact and intersect. Uh, so in allowing, one, the first thing to do is to allow the imagination to run wild. There was a second step in that workshop where we grounded that wild speculation <clears throat> with some reality. And that reality involved an urban sim. The urban sim looked to bring scientific data in the futuring scenario. The urban sim basically demonstrated to participants how data, which our planning processes use, um, projects that future. That takes transportation, policy, land use, plots that over the next 20 to 30 years and demonstrates to people what that future would be like. After acknowledging the urban sim, participants could refine their own imagination and that tempered it a little bit, allowing it to be a little bit more grounded but still have that um, speculative feeling about it. And that was an important recalibration step in the methodology. You need to understand that there was limited resources in, in planning and the way neighborhoods unfold. You needed to then prioritize what were the three most important projects that you think were important and you needed to get consensus with that with your group. With three prioritized projects that have been recalibrated between your wild imagination and the grounding urban sim, you were able to plot these. And you were able to plot these on a physical model. And the physical model became something that as a group you could contest, you could negotiate what was the biggest priorities in this, in this piece. Oh, okay. Uh, the blue line, yeah. This is our sea, the coastal. Remember we talked about coastal yes. development. This is our coastal. And this is the Kailicha Hospital. And there's a bridge that we put there over there. Because there's a, there's a pool here. So we want to connect because there is a, there's a sport complex, Tucson. Tucson, that is there. Tucson. The Tucson yeah. Centre. Yeah. So that we can go over to the swimming pool. So the two some centers where the mall is? Yes. Within the mall? Yeah. Yes. But we wiped out the mall. The mall doesn't no. We are, there's no mall. We have demolished the mall. If I have to reflect on the model building component, the one aspect that was really intriguing was when the different groups had to, if you will, think on their feet. So each group was in a position to refine their proposal, their priorities, and how they would manifest it with the materials at hand. But of course the dilemma was that they all had to work on one model. So once the first group had completed, they had changed the model in effect. And the group was then confronted with this new context, this new reality that they had to respond to. Because shopping centers to begin with, they are private, they are built by private organizations. And the Hout Train already is built by a private organization. And the just the, the, the theme that I'm getting here and the feel that I'm getting from this problems that we have identified is that there's a big miscommunication between the private organizations and the public because and that is the main concern that like everyone has identified is that is that sort of like miscommunication that's happening. And I, mean, given I think that was actually, in some ways one could interpret that as a problem for the methodology, but actually I think that was one of the most interesting things because of course in real life, your ideas always need to um, uh, adapt themselves to what, what the context is and what the constraints are of a particular site or, and so on and so on. And that, that negotiation that had to happen um, uh, sort of on the hoof uh, was a really fantastic uh, a reminder of, of that real life dynamic. It's really very difficult, you know, to imagine how we're going to rebuild this thing because the character of the people determine the character of the community. Even the, the little we have in terms of infrastructure and opportunities here and all that, you can take everything away. But if the character of the people strong, We'll have it all back and more in a very short space of time. There's just no, there's just no question about that. For me, it's not really a sense of saying this is the place to go to and, um, and have that fixed, but it's more directional. So from day to day, 
week to week, month to month, what, what does that direction look like? And I think how the future will actually materialize is going to be different from the way it's envisioned, but it will have the shape of that, that particular vision. There are lots of little techniques and tools that we created for use, or combined, I would say most of them I think we didn't create, most of them aren't novel, they're existing techniques. But what we did was to package them into an overall methodology. But what we've tried to do now is to make sure that these are uh, documented as well as we could, both per project site, but also as generic methodology, and to have those available on uh, the website. So the idea is that the City Futures website becomes not just a repository, um, as a reflection of a project that happened, but hopefully also um, a bit of a toolkit, a bit of a tool base where people can test bits of it, people can add onto it. The idea is that people could add in, say, well, I tried this, but actually I've improved it in this way, or I found this other method actually works better if that's the objective. Um, we hope that happens. Uh, we'd like to think that what we did wasn't just to experiment at some point in time and it's over. Uh, we've obviously, as the participants and as the communities involved, learned something and gained something, but we'd love to see, I guess, the impact of that grow and, and, and build on it. You know, um, learning doesn't stop. Uh, the methods may or may not have been perfect. Um, they can always be improved. They can always be built upon. Um, we ran these also for expedience as fairly short workshops. If a community was doing this themselves, they may see it as part of an ongoing, longer-term process. Possibly one needs then to augment the tools and to look at uh, what tools would suit that kind of an agenda. So I, I hope part of what we've created is um, a basis for growing, uh, a basis for evolving thinking around some of the ideas we tried to experiment with. Um, and maybe the website becomes part of what can contribute to that growing knowledge base, that growing practice base. Mm -hmm.